Hello, everyone, and welcome to In Conversation, Queer Perspectives on Writing and Family with authors Liana Cusmano and Christopher Theorado. This event is organized by Accenti Magazine in collaboration with the Association of Italian Canadian Writers, the AICW, with the support of the Canada Council for the Arts via the Writers Union of Canada. My name is Licia Canton, founding editor-in-chief of Accenti Magazine and past president of the AICW. Before we begin this very important conversation, I'd like to invite Chris to the microphone. Thank you, Licha. Um, yes, before we begin, um, I've been invited to uh, start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I would like to say that um, many of us tonight are queer Canadians of Italian origin, and as such, we are settlers on this land. And um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the communities uh, who were here before us, uh, namely where um, uh, Licha, uh, Leanne, and I are calling in from today, uh, uh, the, the communities of the Ganigahaga, uh, because the city of Montreal, uh, where we're based, is unceded territory and known as Jijage in uh, the Mohawk language. And we are very grateful to be able to live and work on these lands. And uh, we honor and thank the traditional custodians of this land and strive to work for the success of future generations. Thank you, Licha. Thanks very much, Chris. This is our second event of the year. It's my pleasure to introduce our guests, Liana Cusmano and Christopher Di Rado. Liana Cusmano, also known as By Curious George, is a writer, filmmaker, spoken word artist who works in English, French, and Italian. Liana is the 2018 and 2019 Montreal Slam champion and author of the novel Catch and Release, published in 2022. Liana wrote and directed two shorts, Matters of Great Unimportance, 2018, and La Femme Finale, 2016, the latter screened at the Cannes Film Festival. Liana is also fiction editor at Carte Blanche. Christopher Di Rado is the author of two novels, The Geography of Pluto, published in 2014, and The Family Way, published in 2021. Since 2014, Chris has worked to create a space for LGBTQ plus literature in Montreal, producing and hosting the Violet Hour reading series. He is past president of the Quebec Writers Federation and former evaluation committee member on the Conseil des Arts de Montréal. Welcome Liana and Chris, and the microphone is yours. Thanks very much. It's lovely to be here every, with everyone. Thank you all for attending. I am really excited to talk about writing and family and specifically uh, how we queer those two practices of writing and of ha having a family and how those three elements can all come together uh, and also come apart in lots of different ways. I write fiction. I also write poetry and spoken word. Uh, and so there's a lot of writing going on, a lot of family in there and a lot of queer stuff. And so I'm really excited to talk about these things with you, Chris, and to have everyone uh, be here to participate. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Leanne. I completely agree. Um, the topic was very much of interest to me, and I'm really looking forward to digging into it. Uh, just a bit of a note, if people see me looking this way, I just, I've got my questions here. I've got a double monitor thing, so I don't want people to think that I'm looking at Facebook while we're going through this conversation. Um, but I've got a ton of questions for you, Liana, so I'm sure we're not going to be able to get them to them all, but no, um, no, no. just looking forward to having a conversation on the subject. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. I can kick us off, Chris. I have, you know, I was really thinking about this and I put together some questions and every question had a number of, of sub questions. Yeah. And <clears throat> my, my prediction for this conversation is that we'll be going in a number of different directions because it's so easy to branch out into lots of different subjects and areas when you talk about a, a topic like this. Um, so I'll start off with asking you how your relationships to queerness, to family, and to writing have changed or evolved over time, because none of these things exist in a single moment and they all change uh, as we grow. And so for you, how have they evolved? For sure, thanks. Um... I think for me, writing and queerness was always at the beginning. Like I knew that I wanted to be a writer from a very young age. And um, 
No, I guess I shouldn't say that because I guess I wanted to be a writer for the long time. The queerness wasn't there. <laughs> you know, I really wasn't sure what I would write about. And I think uh, as many people, you're trying to figure out what you have to say around the, about the world. And when I was 16 or when I was 17, I don't think I really knew what I wanted to say. I would try to write Stephen King type short stories and, you know, not even really interested in horror, but it was something that I knew an author, I knew what he kind of wrote, and maybe if I could be a writer, I could try to kind of mimic him. But it really wasn't until I came out then and had my heart broken uh, by a guy, I felt, oh, I have something to write about. I actually have a lot of things to write about. And that's where I think the queerness came in. And then it was, I couldn't stop, I couldn't stop writing. Family, however, was something I think is only something that really recently became involved in my writing. I think with the first book, I knew that I wanted to write around, uh, write a story of, of a queer person who had had their heart broken. But as I was writing about that, uh, the queer person's mother kind of started coming into the into the story and became a, a central character. And then with my second book, um, The Family Way, I found myself writing about how queer people make families. You know, I, I think it was a bit of an extension of that. Like, whereas talk, I was writing about the mother in the first book, I was kind of writing about the role of the father in the second book. So I think that's, I guess, for me, how it's changed over time. It, it I seem to keep adding to it, you know, adding, adding to it. And I, I think even my next book is going to go even deeper in family. So um, it's a subject matter I find endlessly fascinating. And I don't think there's like enough that I have to say on the subject. Um, how about yourself? Like, you know, where do these three intersect in terms of your writing? I like how you said that at some point you just couldn't stop. You had yeah. so many things to say. Uh, and I think for me, it's very similar. There are so many things that I have had to say about queerness and writing and family. Um, my first book, Catch and Release, um, when I wrote it, I was identifying as a young woman. I don't identify as a woman anymore. I identify as non-binary. But at the time, I was... Um, a woman writing about this woman who falls for this other woman. And I got responses from publishers who said, a same sex obsession in a romantic way will never be enough for a whole novel. And I was like, you do not know very many queer people at all. <laughs> very, very clearly. Yeah. Um, and I think that when it comes to spoken word, as opposed to fiction, that's where family and queerness and writing the three of them all together seem to converge a little bit more for me. And I think that it's evolved very much in the sense that I write a lot more about my grandparents and my identity as a queer person in relation to my grandparents and my queer identity as a writer in relation to my grandparents in spoken word. And so those very specific elements have been coming closer together most recently um, because my grandparents all met my partner. And when I was younger, writing poetry about queerness um, or about how queer I was or how I felt, I had never imagined that that was something that could ever happen. And so my changing reality became very much reflected in what I wrote about. Mm. Uh, and so those changes in my relationship with myself, with my partner, with my family, all of those have been coming together quite recently, I think. Uh, and specifically in spoken word and not so much in fiction, which I think is different um, from what you just said about Geography of Pluto and Family Way, like these novels about how all those things intersect. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm I'm curious to know, like, so <clears throat> you're, you know, you, you've been doing spoken word for a while, but your first novel came out last summer. And, you know, first books tend to be quite personal and, you know, uh, it's often the first time a lot of your family members will read, um, you know, will have a, a friends, friends too, and family members can kind of peek inside your mind and see how you think. And I'm kind of curious, what was that experience like for you, particularly, I guess, with your family, knowing that people were going to be able to kind of you know, think how you might be thinking, you know, although, although it is fiction, you know, I mean, I think it, there is still kind of a personal element to a lot of this work. So what was what was that experience like for you? It's a great question because um, before the book was finished uh, and definitely before it was published, I had only ever shown it to friends. I had never shown it to any members of my family. And a part of me knew that there was a chance, a significant chance that it would never be published and nobody would ever read it. So it was very good as a, um, as a writer who was trying their hand at a novel for the first time to not really worry about it. There was the feeling of, well, it, it would be a little disappointing if nobody read this because I have things to say that I think other people would want to hear. 
Um, and on the other hand, it's liberating to think that nobody will ever read this. And if in 15 years I look back on it and realize that, you know, I would write the whole thing over again, I can feel this sense of relief. It was really intimidating to realize that this thing is going to be published and people are going to read it. And my family is going to read it and going to have opinions about it. And I think for me, the most difficult thing to sort of contend with was the idea that it's fiction heavily inspired by things that actually happened. And I found myself having these conversations often with friends and family members. Um, and I've seen other writers go through it too, to have readers um, ask, well, who is this character based on? Mm. Uh, or what events inspired this particular passage? And the answer is always, well, this and this, and also none of that. There's this really interesting um, connection between all and none, where it's fiction, but it's also authentic fiction based in a very specific truth. Mm -hmm. um, and truth, I think, is something that, you know, we all have to deal with in one way or another, but specifically within families and family histories, the question, what is the truth? What is the truth to you? How is your truth interpreted by um, somebody else? So um, my family had always been really, really supportive of my writing and they were very supportive when the book came out. Um, and there are some things that I wrote into the book that never actually happened, but I don't feel obliged to point them out. And so I leave them sort of shrouded in mystery. Um, and some readers, including my family, are not are not big fans of that because people want want to know. They want to know oh, exactly yeah. what happened, exactly what's true. Um, but it's fiction. And as the author, I reserve the right not to explain everything uh, because it's a novel. And that's it. I agree, too. Like, you know, I get that question a lot. You know, uh, what happened? Is it autobiographical? And for both of my books, because like, you know, there's two of them now. And, uh, you know, the main character also in both of the books, I have to say, kind of resembles me. So, I mean, if you know me, you probably are projecting me onto, onto the main characters. And the answer I tend to give a lot is just, well, you know what, it's fiction, but its spirit is autobiographical. I think there's so much in the book that uh, feels very kind of authentic to me and who I am as a person. So if you were to read it, I think you'll, you'll see me in it. You'll understand me. If you like the character, you'll probably like me. If you don't like the character, you probably won't like me. Um, but um, yeah, you know, and I have, I have to find that I feel like I'm guilty of it too sometimes when I read another writer's book and I want to know really, you know, what did happen? Did this really happen to you? But, you know, I've learned not to ask that question. Just kind yeah. of leave it in my imagination. Are both your novels written in the first person? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and so is mine. And I think for some people that's, they, they really jump, we all do it as readers. We really jump onto that. Yeah. That will we'll tend to blur together the author, the narrator, and the protagonist when they're actually all usually distinct. Um, so um, I think now's the time where maybe I can do a little reading first. I think that I would think, be great. Me? Yeah, yes. okay. I am so, inviting you to read, Chris. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to read a, a section from The Family Way. Um, so as I think I mentioned, it is a story of um, someone who's been, maybe I didn't mention this, um, my main character is a, is a gay man named Paul who is about to turn 40 and it, uh, he's been asked by two friends to help him start, uh, to help them start, start a family. And the book kind of examines both, what um, kind of follows that experience, but at the same time also examines the relationship that Paul has with his father and also with his uh, lover, uh, Michael, who's a little bit younger than him. So I'm going to read here, just this is the beginning of chapter eight. <clears throat> And so at this point, he's about to turn 40, like I said, and he's already started this process of trying to help bring life into the world. Michael and I kept a calendar on our fridge. We rarely consulted it, appreciating it more for its vintage beefcake shots of men in classical poses. On the first of the month, I flipped the page from July to August, and there, under a stunning black and white photo of a buff and smiling naked man leaning against the tree, Michael had circled the sixth with the words Paul's big day and big black marker. Originally, the plan had been for me to host a dinner party on my birthday, but after I told my friends Charles and Danny about my idea, Charles had called and said no, I would not host my own birthday party. Instead, we would do it at his loft, and he'd be one to have it catered. He also offered to make it one of his soupe des femmes, so everyone would be invited to come in drag or dress or any costume that undermined gender. I was touched. 
The day before, I came home from work to find Michael sitting in front of the stove. The light in the oven on. What are you doing? I asked. Baking cookies, he said. What kind? Your favorite, chocolate chip. I kissed him on the head and, head and left the kitchen to change out of my work clothes. When I returned, Michael was in the same spot, silent, watching the treats rise like a dog at the door waiting for its master. When the cookies were ready, he took them out and cooled them on the counter. He put a few aside and placed them in a plastic container, separating each one by a square of wax paper. Who are those for? I asked. The neighbors, he said. Michael put on his sailor hat and kissed me as he zipped downstairs out the door to visit Jean and Allison, who lived downstairs. I snuck a cookie and went into the living room with a bunch of takeout flyers to order us dinner. But as I was about to dial, the phone rang in my hand. I looked at the call display and saw it was my father. Hello, happy birthday, son, he said after I answered. Thanks, Dad. It's not until tomorrow, you know. I know, I know, he said, and I could hear the joy in his voice. I wanted to be the first to call. You were born three minutes after midnight, but I figured you'd be in bed by then. Well, you'd figured right, I said. I can't believe you're turning 40, son. I can't believe it either, I said. I still remember the party we threw for you for your 40th at the Legion. My mind saw blue and white streamers strung across bowling trophies, cases of Molson X and Labatt 50 behind the bar. I must have been, what, 14? And Kate, 16? I can't imagine what it was like turning 40 with two teenagers in tow. How'd you do it? Lots of beer, he said. And of course there was your mother, God love her. How are you doing, Dad? How's Debbie? She's good. Off biking today with her friends. I pictured my stepmother, Debbie, in a helmet and dark glasses with a fluorescent circling, cycling jersey and a plastic water bottle. Didn't feel like joining them? Not today, he said. I'm coming down with a cold, so I'm watching daytime television. Lots of talk shows and people arguing with each other. Everyone has an opinion these days. I'm tired of other people's opinions. And you're not even on Facebook, I said. My dad laughed. I wouldn't be caught dead on that thing. Debbie is on it enough for the both of us. I figure if something important does happen, she'll let me know. So what are you going to do on the big day, he asked. Oh, just dinner at a friend's, I said, debating telling him that we'd all be in drag. Sounds nice. So when are you and Michael going to come visit? I don't know, Dad. It, it's hard for me to get away. You'd love Kelowna, he said. Debbie, Debbie and I could show you around, and it would be great for you to get to know Patrick and Sue better. I wish you and Kate had come out to Sue's wedding. You could have met that whole side of the family. Debbie's daughter, Sue, had got married the year before to a roofer named Neil. But neither I nor Kate had attended the wedding. I suppose we could have, but neither of us wanted to travel all that way. Plus, it had been gay pride in Montreal, and I didn't want to miss it. My dad might have considered Debbie's relations to be that side of the family, but the idea was ridiculous to me. They weren't a part of our family, so we didn't need to be there. I know, I said. I I'm sorry I missed it. It would have been nice of you to come visit. It would be nice for you to come visit sometime. Your sister's been twice now. Anyways, he said, wrapping things up as our calls never did last for more than several minutes. Tomorrow will be a big day for you, and I wanted to call and wish you a happy birthday before things got too hectic. You know, your mother would have been very proud of what you've accomplished. I froze for a second, a flash of heat in my body. Thanks, Dad. Love you, son. Talk soon. I hung up the phone and composed myself. My dad had gotten soft with age. He was 67 now and more expressive than I ever remember him being. I don't think he had ever said I love you to me growing up, but it's how he ended his calls with me for the past few years. I did feel bad for not visiting, but I only got so much time off of work. Kelowna might be nice, but it wasn't a bustling metropolis like New York City, nor did it have the province town's very gay, sandy beaches. The flight to Kelowna would be long, too. I looked it up one afternoon and learned that it would take seven and a half hours to get there from Montreal. That's a lot of time in the air. There were no direct flights, which meant I'd have to experience twice as many landings and takeoffs. Who was that? Michael said, now standing in the doorway to her living room. My dad, calling to wish you a happy birthday? Did you tell him? No. There was still nothing to tell. I hadn't recently I had recently heard from Wendy, and our second attempt hadn't worked either. We should really visit him sometime, I said. Or I should at least. So thank you. Thanks very much. I it's a habit for me now to to snap, snap. after people read. Um I love the family way. I love that excerpt. Uh, thank you for reading. The thing that struck me the most was that Paul forgoes this wedding um, 
between two people that his father would consider that side of the family. And one of the reasons is that pride is taking place in Montreal. And for many mm. of us, that's a, a time uh, that we spend with our, our chosen families. And so the first question that comes to mind for me is what does family and what does chosen family mean to you? Um, especially in the context of being a sperm donor, which is something that you and Paul share. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I often feel like I, I walk a line between the two. Um, you know, like I, I, I find that I'm very lucky, though, that I have a very close relationship with my family. Like, you know, my, my parents, you know, they're very accepting. We've had our ups and downs about like, you know, my sexuality for sure. But we're at a point, point right now where they're very accepting. They met my partner. They love him. Um, so I have nothing, you know, sometimes I find like, especially in popular culture, it's either one or the other. Sometimes it's either like, you know, you're estranged from your family, you know, and you're just in your queer community, um, or you're kind of like trying to escape your, 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 your kind of family of origin and trying to find community. But like, for me, it was always like between the two. So um, that's what I really wanted to show in this too, is that like, you know, there are these decisions that you have to make when you're a queer person, like exactly like, you know, um, you know, Paul's father has remarried his, you know, the, his wife has died, Paul's mother has died, and he's decided to kind of like pursue family, like another type of family too. And that, like, you know, it's all, I wouldn't say like it's an alternative family, but it's a different family than Paul is used to, right? Like he has his own family out there. And so Paul's very resistant to that. So I felt like the situation added for a lot of tension and really allowed me to kind of show how we try to navigate that line as like queer people. And, um, uh, and then, you know, the whole thing about being a sperm donor, too, is almost this extra level of complexity, too. You know, I, I think when I came out to my family, I don't think they ex expected me to kind of come out a second time and say, by the way, I'm going to have a child with two friends, right? Like, that's almost like another coming out, this other layer, layer of expectation around, well, you know, what does that mean? You know, what, what's, what's your involvement going to be like? You know, what's our involvement going to be like? So I feel like, you know, the, the topic was extremely ripe for uh, for me to kind of delve into it. And although it is kind of like a, you, know, you said, kind of based on personal experience, um, my life didn't have as much drama. So it's really great to kind of like inject that into it and really kind of it's see really exactly, fun. you know, what can kind of come up when you put these characters in the situation and, and this becomes the, the topic. All right. Well, I think now it's my turn to invite you to read. Would you like to read something for, uh, for us? Sure. I would love to. Um... As I said at the beginning, I've been branching out a little bit more into the intersection between queerness and family and specifically Italian uh, families. And so I'll um, perform something for all of you called Mati Fidanza Resti Con Me. We are watching La Mica Geniale, my brilliant friend, because I am afraid that my Italian will soon become a ghost inside my mouth shrink to simple salutations, bookending emails, be relegated to days of the week, dancing at the back of my throat. After every episode following season one, episode four, where we heard it first, I ask, ma ti fidanzeresti con me? The subtitles read, do you want to go steady with me? There is no but at the beginning of the translation, no filler word hiding behind a comma like a single tortellino. The words fidanzeresti, fidanzarsi, are rooted in the gendered words for fiancé, the act of becoming engaged is posited as a question, as a conditional. Even the verb tense is lost in translation. The series takes place at a time when dating wasn't anything so much as the very brief interlude before marriage, when Fellini and De Sica were at work, when some of my grandparents still lived where they had been born. We watched the series on the big TV screen. I refuse to put Parmigiano on our popcorn, as time goes on, still other words evoke a time and place that I thought I had forgotten, a childhood spent on balconies and in backyards and at kitchen tables. Phrases like, dammi la manina, vai a prendere un cerotto, andiamo a fare il bagno. As we watch an Italy constructed for the screen, for storytelling, for entertainment, a carousel of memories comes to life inside my head, of holding Nonna's hand as we cross the street, of fetching band-aids for papa from the bathroom cabinet, of going to the beach and playing in the water. I am afraid that the only leftovers of my childhood will be a language that melts in my mouth before I can speak. After every episode, I ask her, Mati fidanzeresti con me? Because asking in this language and not another feels like reaching into a future where all the words I need are on hand and not on the table. And she never recognizes the words, only the tone. 
only the way I look at her when I say it. She never really understands the first time and I have to repeat it. And so every time I ask her is like the first time. And every time she says yes is like the first time. We live in a daydream of firsts, a real life mini series of always asking to be together and always saying yes. As if we don't hold hands when we cross the street, as if I don't keep her favorite brand of Band-Aid in my bathroom cabinet, as if we've never been to the beach and played in the water or lain together in the sun. On the day she learns the words, posso avere un bacio, may I have a kiss, and says them to me, I realize that this is just another way of saying I love you, which we have said more times and in more ways than I could ever hope to count on all the fingers of all the hands of all the people I knew back when I was four, on the balcone and in the giardino and at tavola. Ti voglio bene grande così, I love you this much. This love is vaster than the biggest measurement I could hope to express by stretching my arms back when I was five. Ma ti fidanzeresti con me? I ask as if I don't know the answer because I never get tired of hearing it. I never get tired of hearing her say yes as if it were the first time. I never get tired of hearing words in our mouths that mean home. I'm going to do my snaps now. That was wonderful. I love, I love that poem so much. Um, thank you. Um, it's interesting because like my brilliant friend was such an inspiration for me too. I, I, uh, the book and the TV series and, um, and I love how you use it also to, you know, to kind of, it's like what you said, like you want to keep it in your, 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 your mouth, right? Like the language. And so um, I'm really jealous because you do speak Italian and, you know, I've been studying on Duolingo for over 500 days now. I'm very proud of myself. That's great. Um, I have yet to have a conversation with someone. We're not going to do it here, but, you know, maybe one day we can go for a coffee, but I'm curious to know, like, like what role does Italian language play, I guess, in your identity and maybe also your identity as a writer? Does it keep you connected to your, to your culture? When I was younger, and I have two younger brothers, and when we were little, we went to um, an Italian elementary school and the Italian high school, and I didn't know anybody who spoke Italian. And they all went to Italian school that did absolutely nothing for any of them. And my parents would nag us about speaking Italian and we only speak Italian in this household and we hated it. It is to this day, the nag, the greatest nag I've ever experienced because speaking Italian is something that I'm so grateful for. And as a child, you don't understand that. You just no. feel like you're being compelled to do something that doesn't make any sense to you. Go to the corner and face the wall and count to a hundred in Italian and I wanna hear you and, and you're not going back to play until that's done. And it's, it's a huge part of who I am. And it's something that I don't practice very much on a daily basis, um, unless I speak to my grandparents really. And their Italian is extremely limited because none of them went past the eighth grade or the fifth grade. And I found myself going to Italy and using words that are not real, that my grandparents mm -hmm. made up and embarrassing myself. Uh, because when I speak to my grandparents, there's a very specific lexicon that is specific um, to Italian Canadians of a certain generation mm. of, of two specific age groups, which are the grandchildren and the grandparents, which is a really, really fascinating phenomenon onto itself. Um, and I have no formal instruction in Italian of any kind. And so my spelling is not good. Um, my grammar is not that great. My pronunciation is, you know, okay. But I found myself wanting to include it more um, in my writing because it's something that will be lost um, if you don't work at it. My partner uh, was also learning Italian on Duolingo. And, and it, that's fascinating to me because my grandmother has no concept of what Duolingo is. There's this little owl and it pressures you every day <laughs> to, to learn something. And she learned, I think it was Il, Ser Il Serpente Nello Stivale, which is the oh. snake is in a boot. And I was mm -hmm. like, you're never going to use that in your life. Um, and then that's okay. Um, and it, you know, my, sorry, my Duolingo also has like same sex couples doing stuff, which is really interesting. So that's cool. Um, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, and it, and so, like you said, it was such an inspiration to watch my brilliant friend. Um, because there are words that you hear like Cerotto. Cerotto is not something I ever heard after I passed the age where I needed band-aids on a regular basis. Mm. Um, and I recently started, my partner and I are watching The Sopranos. We're like 25 years too late um, or, you know, behind. 
And I think it was season two, episode four, and they have that song that, that Andrea Bocelli sang, Con te partiro, just, you know, and it comes in two or three times in the episode. Um, I grew up on it feels like you're, it's something that lives in your body when you've heard it so many times from the time you, you were a little kid. So to answer your question, Italian is, is something that I hold on to very tightly and that I've been trying to exercise more and more as I, as I get older. I think too, what's really exciting is being able to kind of queer that, like, you know, and you are doing that, right? Um, I, I, you know, my, it's only my dad who is Italian on my side, right? And, and um, I, I did not learn the language, but I was surrounded by the culture a lot, like in terms of especially like the, the family meal and, and whatnot. But, you know, my, my perception, a lot of Italian culture wasn't that it was queer or queer friendly, yeah. really, like, I, you know, and it's, you know, it is kind of exciting now to be, you know, doing some of that work myself, like trying to kind of find ways in which I can create content and create stories that, that bring these two together in ways that are, you know, I want to say new, like, I'm not saying, you know, wow, we're so brown groundbreaking there. Are, a lot of people are doing it, but it, it, it just, for me, it feels very, very fresh because um, I feel like there is a lot that I can kind of say that can kind of bring this in a little bit, a bit more. Would you say that that's part of your goals as a writer to try to combine those two things a little bit more? For, at least it, for, for, for now it is, you know, I, I mean, who knows forever, but um, it's definitely inspired me in ways that I never really thought possible. Like, you know, um, one of my questions, actually, the next question I have was just about the documentary that we both we're in, right? So we That's were right. both in creative spaces uh, that Leach directed about the intersections between being queer and Italian Canadian. And, you know, I, I often, I credit your your mother, like Licha, like for really kind of inspiring me to connect with my Italian roots through this project. Like participating in this project was really important for me because it, it allowed me to confront a lot of my prejudice or a lot of my assumptions about Italian culture. And like, I never really felt Italian enough you know, because I was a queer person, because I was only half Italian, but participating in that documentary really kind of opened a floodgate in terms of like content for me and inspiration. So I'm kind of curious for you also, like, like what has changed for you since participating in that documentary? I mean, it was 2020, right? Like the beginning of the pandemic. That's so, right. You know, three years ago, I guess that we filmed that, like how, how has that been for you? The most concrete thing that has changed for me is that my partner has met my entire family and participated in those Italian traditions. And we've had those conversations where she'll say, well, why don't you say this or ask this question um, or do this? And I'll be like, absolutely not. That is just not something that one does. And it could be anything. It could be something really like small and innocuous. Uh, and it's not the end of the world. It's just a habit um, a, a cultural habit um, that you either do or don't do. And it's really difficult to explain. Like right now, I can't even think of a single specific example because it's almost ineffable. It, it really depends on time and place. And so um, it's been really interesting to bring my grandmother and my partner together in the same room and to think to myself, like, I never thought this would ever happen. And my grandmother still thinks that I'm a woman and I'm gay and I'm never gonna have children ever. And my grandfather talks to me in the past, talks about me in the past tense, you never got married. And I was, the, you know, these very interesting cultural generational things that are now up against something that nobody ever thought would happen, which is queerness, these two queer people um, or this one queer person who has brought this other queer person into the family. And so for me, since that documentary, uh, I'm still queer. I still write. I still write about queerness. My family um, is still supportive. My immediate family is still supportive of me and my writing and my queerness. But now also my extended family um, has really been introduced to that. Um, and I, I never thought that I would, I never thought that I would come out to my grandmother um, and I never thought that she would ever like it. Um, 
and I, and even now I can tell myself, oh, I'll never tell my grandmother that I use they, them pronouns. That's not something that I'll ever do. Um, but I, I said the exact same thing about coming out to her as, as a bisexual person. And so you never know mm. what's going to happen or not happen. Uh, and it's been really, really interesting to see that evolution. Um, and I extend it, you know, there's so many different ways to queer family. There's so many different ways to, to queer your everyday typical actions. I extend this almost to, you know, the concept of having pets. Mm -hmm. Pets was not something sure. that, you know, my grandparents' generation ever did unless it was an animal that could fulfill a purpose. You know, my pet rabbit is a creature that I keep alive with my own resources and that I am not raising for food, which is very much queering the concept of having an animal in your possession. And I never expected my grandparents to, to understand that either. And now they ask about, you know, videos. As I say this, I see that cat there um, in one of the participant screens, which is oh. great <laughs> to share our lives with these small creatures. Um, and you, you know, none of us should ever have to justify the joy that we feel for the animals that live with us. Um, but it's something that I've had to explain to my grandparents many times, the same way I've had to explain, well, there's not just gay and straight, there's, there's other stuff going on. And to have them be like, you mean you're like that person on, what was that show? Che Posta Per Te? Che Posta Per Te was this show that ran on Tele Latino and it was about these estranged family members who have to come back together. And the sort of, the general understanding is that the host was a lesbian woman and that was bad. Like I grew up internalizing that um and that was something that my grandparents had also internalized as this is what a queer person looks like mm. um and so i had to challenge a lot of those preconceptions and my grandparents had to challenge a lot of those preconceptions can i can i just I, you know what you were saying about pets just like struck a chord with me you know like um so uh, my partner and i like we lost our cat in theo. october of this year theo and, um, you know, our, my partner and I have been together 14 years and we had Theo for 13 of them. So, and all, you know, he was like our kid, right? Like, you know, and, and, um, and I remember like he was sick for two and a half years. And so Greg and I would like, you know, go to the vet four times a year, get all these supplies every day. We would give him injections. Like, you know, we just loved and cared for him so much as if he was, and, and I remember going to like this, like, this like party at my, my italian cousin's place and i was trying to explain to him at the time like oh my cat's sick and you know i i almost didn't come and he's like oh you know what we would do in my day and i'm like what he's like new cat oh god and i was just like okay you know like and again i was just like wow okay you know we're just totally not on the same page you know and, and you know he's got like kids and he's actually a great my, my cousin's a grandfather right like you know so i i i think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really just show people what it means to kind of be a queer person and have a family like you know I think I think we're I think they understand our partners now I think they understand like you know like generally you know but even beyond that even just like saying like our friends are our family like you know if, if, if I had a if I had a friend call me up in the middle of the night and needed me to do I'm going to be there for them right like that's right and, not to say that like my cousin wouldn't, but my cousin is a different set of priorities because he has his family. He has them all kind of built in. They're all in his house. You know, he sees them every week. And I feel like that to me is something that, um, and it's not just Italian people, I would say that kind of have that. I think it's just in general. And I feel like that's something that I would love to see more of in literature and popular culture is the different ways in which we actually do have family and how those families are valid. I think so. I think you make a really, really good point how do we explain to our traditional, the traditional members of our families, the way that we are queering the concept of family. And I think that ties into writing very nicely because to me in many ways, writing um, is the queering of the traditional career path uh, to queer something or some place or some activity to queer it as a verb is I think a really, really interesting phenomenon to this day. I don't think my grandparents have any idea what I do. Mm. I, they have no idea what I do. Um, I work at the computer um, <laughs> and I work for a nonprofit uh, and I write my poems and the nonprofit that I, I work for um, called Poetry and Voice also makes poetry accessible to elementary and high school students across Canada. And it's not something that ever really struck a chord with them. Um, and the concept of work, I think that's something that's a little bit easier to understand is that 
Um, you work very hard, you work a certain number of hours, you have specific financial or personal or professional goals. Um, but the concept of the gig economy, the concept of working as a writer uh, and balancing that with other personal or professional commitments is something that uh, is totally foreign to um, people of a certain age of a certain generation and specifically a, of an Italian generation, certainly in my family. Um, I don't know the Italian word for self-employed. So I think the, the next question I have for you in that vein is how do you strike the work-life balance of being a writer professional circumstances? Because I think the days of like, for a lot of us, of working nine to five at an office job from the time you're 18 or 19 until you're 65, that's increasingly rare and increasingly difficult to maintain. So how do you balance writing when you're working either full-time, part-time, when you're in between jobs, when you're self-employed, what does that look like for you? And how do you it, explain it to people who may ask? It's tough. You know, like, it's funny because like, I, I have a career as a communications professional, you know, like I, I've worked for many different organizations and I think people are always impressed when you say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm writing a novel, right? Like, and but then when you actually publish it, they're like, holy cow, you wrote a novel? Like, how did you do that? They didn't that? believe like, you when you said it. They didn't believe, yeah, oh, that's cute. You think you've got a Good for you. Novel? Good for you. Um, uh, I, you know, it took me 14 years to write my first book. It took me seven years to write my second book. Um, neither of them made me really any money. Like, you know, like to be to be frank, it's not, it's not something that um, I'm putting all of my eggs in one <laughs> Ask, is that the metaphor? Yeah. Um, you know, and and I had a frank conversation too once with someone who is kind of high up in Can Lit, and he basically told me, he's like, Do you know how few people in the country actually make a living from their writing? And so, like, I I, you know, and I I I've what I've tried to do is to manage my own expectations around that and not kind of like, okay, I'm just gonna do this communications thing until my writing takes off. I don't know if my writing will ever kind of take off, but as long as I'm having fun doing it, um I'm gonna keep doing it. Uh, so I guess in that way, it's hard to say it. It's like, it feels like a hobby to me, like, um, because it's something that's never really going to put meat on the, on the table, at least not now. Um, but, uh, so I think I'm just saying I'm answering your question there. It, it's complicated for me. Like I'm always trying though, to find ways to work that dovetail with my interest in yeah, writing. Right. So, important. you know, working as a journalist or, um, you know, uh, like what the work you're doing, I'm sure is extremely uh, rewarding. You know, I've done a lot of stuff with like literary organizations as well as in promotion. And that's always, it keeps my toe in the water. But um, I just have to really turn the screws with myself and make sure that I'm sitting in the seat when I can, you know, if it's every day for like a half an hour, even if it's like opening a Word document and looking at the words for like five minutes, I just need to, I, I'm not counts. always saying that I'm really good at it, but um, I try to find the time. And then, um, I mean, I'm the one who on the weekends will want to write. Like, you know, I, I'm like, it's my day off. I'm going to write, you know, um, and that's what I try to do. But it just, it ends up taking so long. How about yourself? Like, how, how do you negotiate the, the, the two? It's really hard, which is exactly what you said. Um, I think being flexible but also disciplined with yourself is really important so what you said about tightening the screws making sure that you even if it's just to open the word document i think that's really important so much of it is getting into the mental space um if i look up a really really specific fact about snails that i heard somewhere and that i need to corroborate for this poem that i really want to finish and that i've been working on for six years and that takes me two hours that's part of the writing process because that detail the the complexity and wordplay of the entire piece hinges on that one detail and so sometimes someone will ask what did you do today and i'll say oh well geez i just was on wikipedia all day um and i didn't produce anything it still counts as work it's just difficult to explain it that way because you don't have anything to show for it you don't have a, a product to offer up to people and so um i think it's important sometimes to set aside a really, really specific day or a really specific time of day and to treat it like any other doctor's appointment or professional commitment, like from this time to this time, I am not available because why should 
this professional goal of mine or this personal goal or this creative goal be any less important than my physical health or my professional commitments? I think it's a question of deciding what your priorities are and then sticking to those. And it's difficult to do that because we're taught that we need to produce or we need to prove what it is that we've done or we need to expend energy in a way that's productive or logical to anybody who would happen to ask. And none of that is true. They're all just things that we've sort of internalized and that we take as fact. And it takes a lot of confidence and nerve to say, actually, I'm going to do, I'm going to spend the whole day writing. I'm going to finish my novel, or I'm going to tackle a new poem about what have you. And it's important to me and I'm going to do it. And I don't care what anybody else has to say about it, which is, is really challenging. The thing that helped me the most was to say on this day, I'm writing, I am writing on this day. I find I get, I get depressed if I, if I don't, if I, if I take myself away from it too long, mm -hmm. I find I get miserable. I get angry. I get like, you know, and I, I think I, I only realized that recently, like, you know, I, I get more anxious when I'm not able to do it, even if it is just, like I said, 15 minutes a day, I, I need the proximity to it. And, um, you know, for a while there, I was doing those let's write that, um, yes, yeah, so we did a couple, one or two and, together. Yeah. Yeah. I see double. Yeah. And I felt that was really great to kind of just be accountable, sit in the chair, um, you know, bang outs as much as I can. Some days were good. Some days were bad, but, um, I'm, I'm, I know we're kind of coming at to the end of the, the time here, but I was kind of curious about what's next for you in terms of your projects. I mean, you've, you've published a novel. You're still obviously writing poetry. Are you working on anything? I'm working on my first poetry manuscript, which I'm finalizing with a couple of, of wonderful mentors. And I would like to see it published in the next couple of years. So for me, the next project is the first, you know, we were talking about concreteness and, and products is to have a concrete product in my hand to embody um, spoken word and poetry. And so that's the next thing. Um, and I've noticed that if I, when I perform, when I do shows, when I go to classrooms, it's difficult to just rattle off a poem one after another. And so in between you have sort of banter. Um, and I've realized that that's, it's almost like small individual miniature stand-up routines in between each poem, um, which I think might be something really interesting uh, to explore. What about yourself? I, I'd, like to, I, I'd like to see that. Um, myself, yeah, I'm, I'm working on my next novel. I'm kind of making a lot of progress on it, which feels really great. There's a lot of research uh, in this one as well, which involves a lot of family research uh, in terms of like where my family comes from and also like in terms of Italy, but also Montreal. Um, and at the same time too, I've just decided that I wanted to turn the family way into a TV series. I don't Oh, know. that's a great idea. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot of idea. experience in um, screenwriting, but that's something I want to, it's a skill I want to develop. So um, that might be something that I will pursue this summer if I can. That's fantastic. I would love to see that on the, the small screen, the silver screen. Uh, does anyone have questions? Should we take some questions? Absolutely. If there are any questions from have... the audience. So there's a question here. I'll read it. Chris and Liana, um, the Canadian publishing industry is very inclusive. Is the Italian publishing industry queer friendly? would they be interested in translating here and now? Um, which is the anthology, an anthology of queer Italian Canadian writing. I, you know- Good question. I, I, I just went to uh, Guadalajara for like this uh, literary festival. I was lucky enough to be able to go. And my editor met with a bunch of people from different countries, including someone from Italy, who basically told him, no, no one's gonna be interested in that. They're, they're still very conservative there. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, at least it was a firm no. <laughs> yeah, they were they were honest. Uh, um, I, I I I refuse to kind of give up on that. I I mean, I I think there are some publishers that are publishing queer works. I just don't know who they are, and I'm trying to find out. I'm trying to do research. I found I'm following people on Instagram, and there's a couple of publishers that seem to publish queer authors. So, uh, but they tend to be really famous queer authors, right? So, um, yeah. Do you have do you have any thoughts on on that, Liana? There was an Italian publisher who had expressed interest in translating my book Catch and Release, uh, and I have not heard anything from them since then. Uh, 
which is interesting because this whole conversation has been about family and queerness and writing. And if my book were to be translated in Italian, my grandparents would be able to read it, mm. which is not something that I had ever counted on. Um, and as for, you know, the inclusivity of the, the Italian publishing scene, you know, it's like you said, Chris, uh, I don't know, definitely something worth exploring for, for those of us who are queer and Italian Canadian, for sure. All right, any, any other questions? Can I just, uh, hi, hi everybody. Uh, just on this, I wanted to say about the um, publishers. I'm um, at the moment uh, involved with the Fandango, who seems to be very, very open to um, queer, uh, queer literature and queer also um, theoretical work. So there are uh, certainly new uh, small uh, um, publishers, but not so small. Fandango is a medium one who are uh, interested in. Um, in queer literature, there are not many. Lots of being published in translation recently for what concerns uh, more theoretical work than literature, but there is also interest, uh, in, in, in interest in literature. So I would really try to, you know, you to push and um, pursue that. I mean, you have always to bear a bit with Italian published, they might not answer immediately, but I think uh, that th this is a period uh, where there's a lot of um, being published also recently in the last couple of years, a lot of, um, for example, the translation of Belux have been published and I've got um, a friend who's uh, translating them and I'm co-translating now an anthology of um, writing by Sarah Ahmed. And um, with the same publisher, um, there will be another book by Ahmed um, uh, translated, being translated now and being published. So there's, um, you know, uh, Gloria and Zaldua has been just translated. Uh, th there's a lot of new work being published, I've seen like in the last uh, in a few months. So I think it's a moment to, you know, to try to at least be try to you know to see if he managed to yeah to get through at least uh, I'm not sure exactly which but there is Eris Edizioni for example FQ who's in, which is interested in uh, um, queer stuff uh, Edizioni Minoritarie uh, that publishes mainly theoretical work but Fandango itself maybe might be um, um, uh, edit a yeah, I found one called Playground. I think I don't know if it's connected to Fandango, but it would seem to they were publishing Edmund White and um, yeah, yeah. You know, never heard back from them. I kind of sent stuff, but yeah, I think we just have to be tenacious. We have to kind of just be, you know, sometimes it's all the ways about like the meeting the right people and being in the right spaces, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. But definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, thank you everyone for like the, the comments in the chat. This is really wonderful. Michael, did you have a question? I saw your hand go up a couple of times and you're yes, sorry. Oh, <laughs> the, walking in the background. I was trying to use the, rack, uh, the reaction, but it wasn't working. Um, I just I didn't know if either of you had something that was um, queer and Italian that you would recommend, whether that be a TV show or a book or a graphic novel or whatever it might be. I didn't know if there's anything that, that inspired you in that way. That's a great question. Um, do you mind if I go first? No, no? not at all, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so uh, I'm, because I'm so wanting to learn Italian, I'm actually absorbing a lot of either Italian music and, and film and television. I discovered two really great series that I really loved. Uh, they're both, one's on Netflix and one's on Prime. The one on Netflix is called Baby and it's like, it's set in a high school and the main characters are not queer, but they do have a queer storyline, uh, which, which I found was really well done. You know, the, the son of the principal of the school is kind of queer and, um, and he deals with a lot of bullying, um, but I don't want to give any any much away, but it's, it's just about like kind of high school tensions and drama. drama. And then on uh, Prime, there's a series called Prisma, which is also set in high school. And it's the story of two identical twins. The one actor plays both roles. And one of the twins is questioning his sexuality and also gender identity. And 
it's I don't know I just find it's so well shot the acting is really great the dialogue is great and it's so beautiful to see it like set in like places like Rome and and whatnot so you you kind of get it all those are two things that come immediately to mind to me nothing immediately came to mind for me uh and so I'm I'm glad to hear about those those two things I think it's always exciting to see films and television and and popular culture where these two identities can converge the the only thing that came to mind for me was queer coded sort of Italian icons um based on discussions I've had with Elio Iannacci who's in this who's in this zoom room like Mina I mm. I went through my grandmother's house and took all of her Mina tapes uh you know the tapes from what are they they're sort of over there in the corner from from Gente um which is the only intersection between queer and Italian identity that I could find in the physical place of my grandmother's house. And so to look for um, other examples of that in art, I think is really exciting and really important. So I'll, I'll be looking into those two things that you mentioned, Chris. And if people here also have things to recommend, please put in the chat. Uh, yes, Gender <laughs> Failure, um, Ivan Coyori and, and Ray Spoon. That's a fantastic, fantastic publication. That's really cool. I'm glad to see that recommend. There's another question here, uh, Luce. Hi, yeah. Um, I my name is Luce. Use the hand you pronounce, um, and I'm trying to figure out this technology. Um, I really enjoyed uh, your conversation and your dialogue, the way you both worked with each other. Um, there's this concept that I couldn't help thinking about, you know, and the whole like choosing to go to the family thing or going to Pride and kind of the conversation around Pride and our family of choice. My friend Maria Fama writes about the comare, the comare, you know, and this notion of people that we're not blood related to, but they're like family, you know? And that's the closest thing that I can think to like explain or have even a structure or apparatus in our culture for naming, you know, those that we are close to, that we choose, that are, you know, of our chosen family. So I don't know, I just kind of wanted to comment around that and uh, Maria Fama's work is can be found on uh, uh, Guernica. I think it's called Guernica Press. Um, so anyway, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't thank know you for that, mentioning that, that. Yeah, I don't know that 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 term. Uh, how is it? How does it translate? How would you translate that? the The comare is is like your family member who's not blood related. I don't know, Luce. Like how how you would. Um, how you would translate um, that like it, in some cases it's like the person who like your your godparent almost like anybody who was there at your baptism or your communion or your 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 confirmation is is non-blood related family that's right way, I had totally forgotten about that yeah and the way that um, Maria writes about it is that there were comares that were peers and that would bring each other cards at at their you know holidays and at birthdays and there's um you know, they would bring each other plates of food. And it was this very, she writes about it in this way that it was very queer. Um, and, and that she even took a card and wrote down, crossed out husband and said to my dear Komari, you know, this is a true story. And it's this this love affair of the, the connectedness of family of choice. And also I think it is godparent or godmother, but, you know, blood related. I just think there's a real piece to that. Um, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, okay. Now, yeah, I just wanted to say is exactly godmother, the, the, the immediate translation, but it doesn't really uh, exhaust all the meanings because uh, you can call a comare someone who's very close to the family and not being a, a god, the godmother, as uh, for example, in my Italian family, they have a friend, they call her comare, but she's not a godmother, but it's the comare for all of us. So, so it's, uh, it's a close family member, closer. Is not blood, uh, you know. There are no blood ties, but is is a family. Uh, is is someone is is part of a family. Is just a friend, but you know, but it's more than just um, a common friend. It's a spe specific friend or special friend. Yeah. So it's interesting to know that it's been it's been written about. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. There there are some great comments in the chat. Um, how could we forget Pier Paolo Pasolini, the giant? Um, Matteo Lane as well. Mm. 
And, and some of these things are, some of these terms are, are unique to, to certain regions or certain villages or, or certain families, which is a whole other interesting layer to it. We're coming up on, on the time. Um, this has been wonderful. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you, Liana. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm sure we didn't get to most of my questions, so we'll have to go for coffee, Liana. Oh, for we can sure. Talk a little yes. bit more. Um, be great. Yeah. Um, I'm here. Okay, there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Liana and Chris, for sharing your writing and your experience. The conversation was really stimulating. Um, if anyone is interested in getting a closer look at Leanne and Chris, if you haven't seen the documentary, both Leanne and Chris are featured in the documentary Creative Spaces, Queer and Italian Canadian 2021, as well as Steve Galuccio with a commentary by, um, that is academic scholarly commentary uh, by Dominic Beneventi, who is a queer studies expert. Uh, it's on the Accenti YouTube channel and I have put the link in the chat. Special thanks to the Canada Council for the Arts and the Writers' Union of Canada. This event was organized by Accenti Magazine in collaboration with the Association of Italian Canadian Writers. The next Accenti event is a workshop on January 27th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, a 90-minute workshop titled Self-Editing 101, Writing Concisely and Effectively with Dominic Cusmano, who is the publisher of Accenti. And I hope some of you will join us. Um, and the AICW uh, holds its second online event of the year on Saturday, January 21st with readings and academic papers. Uh, I want to, uh, to thank Achenti, that is Dominic, behind the scenes for technical assistance. To find out more about Achenti, go to achenti.ca. You can check out the details for our Festival of the Arts, which will be held in Calabria next June. June 28th to July, 20, uh, to July 1st. It's uh, Chenti's 20th anniversary. To find out more about the Association of Italian Canadian Writers, I invite you to go to aicw.ca. There are a number of calls for submissions that might be of interest. For instance, the 40th anniversary anthology, we started really early. That will be coming out in 2026. If you're Italian Canadian, if you write, uh, if you're an emerging writer, please, Look at that on the site, AICW.ca, and, um, you know, query if you're not sure. Just ask questions. Um, there is also a call for the second volume, um, the Queer Italian Canadian Anthology. The first one is titled Here and Now. Uh, I put the link to that in the chat, and I'm working on a second anthology. And I want to thank those of you here who have already sent submissions to that, to that anthology. Thank you all for being here this evening and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.